Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, we're talking about China again. And we're asking the obvious question, which is, how did China do it? How did China go through this dramatic transformation in terms of wealth and power? How did it go from being a country with one of the lowest per capita incomes in the world to, within the span of just a few decades, becoming a superpower? The most common explanation I've seen says they did it by introducing capitalism. And then from there, Adam Smith worked his magic, and that's basically the end of the explanation. I think that's definitely a big part of the answer, but I think that on its own is also clearly insufficient. China is hardly the only country in the world with capitalism. And we're trying to figure out what makes China different. Why is China seeing this strong growth sustained decade after decade that other countries aren't seeing? So I think there's still more to the answer here, and we're gonna try to fill that out today in a way that's hopefully a little bit more satisfying. So how did China do it? In my research, I came across a bunch of factors that I lumped into three categories, and I'm just gonna give you them up front. The first one is luck and natural factors. By natural factors, I mean factors that were already in place for China to work with by the late 70s. The next one is intelligent leadership. So these are factors related to decision making by Chinese leaders. And the last one is culture, specifically relating to work ethic. I'm going to spend the video going through these one at a time, starting with luck and natural factors. China has the good fortune of having some natural geopolitical advantages, and one of them relates to the neighborhood that it's in. As one economic analyst put it, proximity to rich neighbors is a key determinant of economic growth, and in this regard, China won the lottery. China is surrounded by industrious neighbors who were willing to invest in it and trade with it. And on top of that, China has the good fortune of not being landlocked, so it has ports that are well positioned for trade routes to the north, to the south, and even across the Pacific Ocean to the east. China also had the good fortune of industrializing at a magic time, which was when modern shipping techniques were developed. As these shipping techniques spread, globalization spread, and China was in a position to capitalize on that. China had what some people call the advantage of backwardness, which means being able to combine modern innovations from abroad, like in science and industry, with low-wage workers back at home, in this case in China meaning that you can offer the possibilities and the efficiencies of modern production, but at a cheaper cost. So as globalization was picking up, China was able to offer itself as an enticing option to countries and companies around the world, saying, come invest in us, come manufacture here, and we'll provide low-wage workers. Not just that, but extremely low-wage workers. And this wasn't any average labor pool. This was the largest labor pool on earth with about a billion people living in China at the time. Not only that, but China's population was disproportionately young. China recently had baby booms, mostly in the 50s and 60s, making their population almost double in 30 years, meaning that China had a massive population of able-bodied people willing to work for extremely low wages. Combine that with being in a great spot for importing and exporting, and you should be able to see how the opportunity was there for a massive global shift towards manufacturing in China. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. If we rewind back to the mid-70s, China was still an introverted socialist country, with most of its citizens being peasants working on collective farms. So to capitalize on the opportunities of globalization and to make this transformation into modernity, China had to go through some growing pains, which required some intelligent decision-making from its leaders. Chinese leaders, starting in the mid-70s, made a crucial, difficult step. And that was to say, what we're doing isn't working. We need to admit that we're wrong, have humility, and learn from the outside world. So what they did was they started sending groups of officials abroad, notably to Eastern Europe, Hong Kong, Western Europe, and Japan. Summarizing what they learned from the trips, reformists like Deng Xiaoping started saying things like, Recently, our comrades had a look abroad. The more we see, the more we realize how backward we are. Encouraged, they sent more officials abroad and instructed them to have broad contacts, make detailed investigations, and carry on deep research into the issues. Look at how they manage their economic activities. We ought to study the successful experiences of capitalist countries and bring them back to China. In their travels, those officials were stunned by the high standard of living of ordinary workers and reported, 
In little over one month of inspection, our eyes were opened. Everything we saw and heard startled every one of us. We were enormously stimulated. We thought capitalist countries were backward and decadent. When we left our country and took a look, we realized things were completely different. Chinese officials began to increasingly corral around the idea that some amount of liberalization was going to be both necessary and healthy for China. To make that liberalization happen required some political maneuvering within the Politburo. But I'm going to skip that and go straight to talking about the way in which China liberalized, because I think the manner in which they liberalized is the important takeaway for this story. And the first point I want to make is about the speed of their liberalization. In the politics of globalization in the 1980s and the 1990s, there was a debate raging about how quickly and how thoroughly developing countries should liberalize. On one side of the debate, you had advocates for shock therapy, which means they thought liberalization should happen quickly and thoroughly. The shock therapy approach was notably embodied by the United States and the International Monetary Fund. Countries around the world followed their advice, including Russia and many countries in South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. But there is another school of thought referred to as the gradualists, who believed that liberalization should happen at a slower pace and in a certain order. To spoil the ending of that drama, the gradualists ended up being correct. The countries that tried the shock therapy approach and tried to rapidly make their economies resemble that of the United States might have seen growth for a short time, but then their economies all inevitably either struggled, stalled, or failed and the gradualists, in comparison, did better. Getting back to China, as you probably guessed, China wisely practiced the gradualist approach. China slowly and carefully experimented with aspects of capitalism in certain provinces and in certain cities in China. And if those experiments worked, and many of them did, then Chinese leaders would consider making reforms more broadly across China. But even then, those broad reforms might be done in a partial gradualist way, like in the case of the two-tier pricing system, which was designed to ease China off of fixed prices and onto market prices, and meant that Chinese producers would have fixed prices up to a certain quota, and if they produced over that quota, then they could sell whatever they produced over that quota at market prices. Once Chinese leaders felt that the growing pains were over, they got rid of the two-tier pricing system and allowed market pricing. So that was one essential thing that Chinese leaders got right, liberalizing at a gradual controlled speed. Another essential thing they got right was liberalizing and industrializing in the correct order. And to make that point, we need to think about farmers. Or even better, think more broadly about agriculture. Before countries industrialize, they're typically based in agriculture. That's just something that pre-industrial countries do. So if you haven't really industrialized, you're going to have large numbers of people working in agriculture and their skills won't be compatible with modern work environments. So if you want to modernize your country and be able to churn out companies that can innovate and compete in global markets, then you need to do it in a way that brings your population with you on that journey. China was no exception to that. In the 70s, most people in China were still peasants working on collective farms. Chinese leaders studied modernization techniques that had been tried by different countries around the world. And in particular, they focused on Japan. Meiji Japan's industrialization process had worked remarkably well and quickly brought Japan into competition with the West. That process was studied and copied elsewhere in Asia, like in Taiwan and South Korea. Chinese leaders had done their homework, and they believed that Japan's process was the best option for China. Now China was going to follow suit. Here's what they did. They started with land reform, which in their case meant breaking up their collective farms and instead making smaller groups of people, like families, responsible for smaller pieces of land. Having smaller groups of people invested in smaller pieces of land meant that more food was grown on the same amount of property. That created a surplus, and that surplus is a big deal for countries whose economies are based in agriculture. China then took that surplus that was coming out of the country and invested it in cities, specifically focusing much of their investments in light manufacturing. So they began making simple products like textiles, 
begging, borrowing, and stealing technology from abroad to do it. These investments in manufacturing cause people to move from the country to cities looking for work. The jobs they find there help them begin learning the skills they need in modern work environments. As this went on, China also started investing in heavy manufacturing, making more capital-intensive products. As companies developed, China practiced export discipline, meaning the government offered subsidies to their companies if they could reach certain export quotas. The companies that hit those quotas now faced global market competition, competition from which they learned and grew. At the same time, the Chinese government protected industries they thought were too vulnerable to face competition from the outside world with measures like tariffs, while also controlling things like interest rates and exchange rates in order to drive development. You can think of this development model as having three parts, land reform into household farming, export-oriented manufacturing, and closely controlled finance that supports the two sectors. By the way, some of these ideas came from regular Chinese citizens, like the initial idea for the two-tier pricing system, and some ideas relating to land reform. So I'm simplifying by tying all of this to Chinese leaders. But I do think they get a lot of credit. They get credit for admitting their problems and choosing to learn from the outside world. And they get credit for their gradualist approach towards liberal reforms. And they get credit for diligently following a tried and true development model that raised money for industrialization, brought peasants from the countryside into cities, and incentivized companies to develop and compete in global markets. Now, I think the X factor in this whole equation is the Chinese work ethic. Since the 70s, China has developed a strong, competitive, can-do work culture. People in China are judged heavily by their ability to succeed and provide for themselves. Pressure comes from friends, family, coworkers, and from the dating world. So there's pressure on an individual level to succeed, and there's also often pressure on a collective level. People might be pressured to succeed for the sake of their families or for the sake of the country. So in terms of work ethic, the standards and expectations in China are high, beginning early in life in the education system. In early education, Chinese students work longer hours and have shorter holidays than in the West. And those longer hours are often supplemented by after-school tutoring. The most dramatic obstacle for Chinese students is the Gaokao, which is their college placement exam. A higher score on the Gaokao means a higher chance of getting into prestigious colleges, which has a profound effect on your future chances of success. So students study especially hard in preparation for it. If you're looking at the picture that I'm showing, you can see a blackboard in the background with a countdown until exam day. Once they're out of the education system, people in China work longer hours than people in Western countries. And if you want a prestigious, high-paying job at a company like Huawei, you're going to have to work incredibly hard for it. Huawei is an extreme example of Chinese hustle culture, which is described as having its own wolf culture, meaning that the company cares less about making work fun and enjoyable and cares more about fostering cutthroat competition within the company. Tech companies in China tend to be famously demanding of their workers. You might have to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m six days a week, also known as 996. That standard tends to come from the employees themselves, causing other employees to have to also meet that standard if they want to compete. That also tends to break labor laws, but the labor laws tend to not be enforced. However, that could be changing. When a country is doing well, I think it's easy to say that it must have something to do with the culture there. So I think that's a common fallacy that I don't want to fall into. So I don't want to put too much weight on the section because I haven't seen anyone try to quantify it. But I imagine that it must have been some sort of X factor that helped things along. And if I had to pick one aspect of it that I thought helped the most, it would be the national focus on education. So in sum, between luck and natural factors, having great neighbors, great shipping routes, modernizing during the beginning of globalization, and having a huge young population, combined with intelligent leadership decisions, who introduced capitalist reforms, but crucially did it gradually and carefully, diligently following a tried and true modernization process that created domestic companies capable of competing globally, while also having a remarkable work ethic, especially in the education system. In combined effect, you have decades of strong, sustained growth and the emergence of a superpower. And that's it for today. 
By the way, for everyone that helped on the last video doing the algorithm stuff, it seems like it helped because that video is doing well. So thank you. I don't plan on asking for that type of thing very often because I don't think the audience really wants to hear it. But if you want to keep on doing it, I would appreciate it. And for this video, for everyone that watched, thank you. And I hope to see you next time.